Healthcare Committee and House Healthcare Committee. We're meeting jointly today to hear a report from the Affordable Accessible Healthcare Task Force that met um, during the summer and fall. And now we have a final report. We were fortunate during our meetings to have a consultant work with us. And we've asked the consultant to put the report together and to provide us with some information so that we can understand next steps in improving healthcare, our healthcare system in terms of accessibility and affordability. Representative Lippert and I co-chaired the committee and we had joining with us two other senators and two other house members. And I think uh, as you look at the report, you will see that the house members were representative Donahue and representative Lori Houghton. Uh, the two Senate members were representative uh, Senator Keisha Rahm and Senator Richard Westman. So those folks were uh, on the committee, on the task force. We worked very hard. We were limited in the amount of meeting time that we had. I think we were limited to five meetings, Bill, Representative Lippert. And so getting the work done to look at turning the Titanic away from the iceberg, trying to improve the healthcare system so that it is more accessible for folks and more affordable for folks was quite a challenge. So the report that you have before you, and as we go through it, you will see, there are recommendations, but it means that once we have understood the recommendations that we will be working at least in our committee in the Senate, it will be our job to begin a committee bill or to integrate some of these recommendations into a bill that's currently in committee. Uh, so there's work ahead of us, but we are extremely appreciative of all the work that Joshua Slen has done for health systems transformation and others um, who you'll meet today. So I'm gonna ask Bill, uh, Representative Lippert, do you have any comments that you would like to make? And then uh, we'll turn it over to Joshua Slen to take us through the report. Yeah, I would say what we're going to do today is a relatively high level overview of uh, the work of the task force and recommendations. Uh, because of timing and other issues, there has not been a formal adoption of the report, but we will be moving toward that in the next day or so. Um, again, uh, I think we uh, today will get a high level and there will be opportunities uh, throughout today for some questions, but there'll be opportunities to ask uh, more in depth and hear more in depth presentations at another point in time. So with that, I think uh, Senator Lyons, I'll turn okay. it back to you or turn it over to uh, Joshua Slen to- Why don't we, yes, I think, but thank you for your comments because they're, they're important to the process. Um, uh, Joshua, welcome. Good to see you. And uh, we have two documents on our web pages. One is the full report from the task force, and the other is a slide deck. And uh, it's my understanding that we'll begin to go through the slide deck today, and then we'll uh, at least we'll take another day or so either separately in our committees or together, we'll be going through the rest of the slide deck in more depth. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, um, nice to see you again. Um, happy 2022 to everyone. Uh, and for those who don't know me, I'm Joshua Slen, um, and my firm Health System Transformation was contracted by the Legislative Joint Fiscal Office to support the committee, um, to support the Joint Task Force on Affordability and Accessibility. I'm gonna walk through today with help from a couple of other folks that I wanna let introduce themselves here in a moment. Um, we pulled together a, a team uh, in order to uh, address all of the issues that were in the task force charter. Um, and so we did look at a number of different things, including what's going on at the federal level, what's going on in other states, what Vermont has done contextually over the last 20 years. Um, then, so what could be done today 
uh, in Vermont and uh, what else is being done today in Vermont, right? So um, all of those things are important, as you know, because the, the healthcare is a complex um, beast and making little changes can have big impacts. Um, and so with that, um, I want to turn it over to um, Beth and then Tim and Lorraine um, to say in that order to just say who they are, where they're from, um, why they're here, um, however you want to do your introductions. And uh, then I'll start off by running through. We're going to try and run through about 15 slides today. Um, so uh, the slide deck that you have in front of you is like 40 something slides. And the rest of the slides after slide 15 start to get into the individual uh, options in depth. And we're going to provide some overview of those options. And we can keep going today to time allowing and how, how much energy people have. Um, but uh, we expected that we would get through the high level sort of what we've done, um, how we got here, and what we're proposing. And that, that going into the depth on those proposals would be something that would happen at future meetings. So that's the outline for today briefly. And Beth, let me turn it to you, Tim, and then, and then Lorraine to do introductions. Great, thank you, Joshua. Hi, everybody, I'm Beth Waldman. I am from Baylet Health Purchasing and uh, we are a small consulting firm uh, based in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And um, I have known Joshua for quite some time. I was the Medicaid director in Massachusetts while Joshua was the Medicaid director in Vermont um, and at Baylet Health, where I've been for 15 years. Uh, we work uh, with uh, several states, including Vermont, on many strategies to contain healthcare costs and improve access to healthcare. So happy to be here and participate in this project. And I will turn it over to Tim. Great. Thanks, Beth. Uh, good morning. My name is Tim Hill. I'm a vice president here at the American Institutes for Research which is a social science research firm here and based largely in Washington, DC. Um, happy to be on this project. I think what I bring um, uniquely here and, and what we've talked about is my experience at the federal level, uh, thinking through the implications of changes of state policy on, um, on, on federal payment and coverage programs, particularly Medicaid and the marketplace. So I've been very happy to, to be part of the process and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Lorraine Siciliano. I worked uh, for the state of Vermont for over 30 years in the Department of Health and in the Department of Vermont Health Access and in the Department of Taxes. And I joined Joshua at uh, Health System Transformation, his firm, uh, in 2021. Thanks. So thanks, guys. Um, and then for those of you who don't know me on the call, um, I worked for Dean and Douglas, um, so a long time ago, but I worked for two governors here in Vermont. Um, and prior to that, I worked for 10 years in Ohio um, with the state legislature. So I worked for about 20 years in state government, 10 of which directly in Vermont. Um, and I worked in the budget office in Vermont. I was the Medicaid analyst. Um, and um, I was the deputy commissioner of finance and management. And then I was the, um, the Medicaid director for six years. Um, and so a number of you know me. Um, I recognize a number of faces here, which is wonderful. Um, and a number of you don't know me. And um, hello, um, here I am. Um, after I left um, uh, uh, State government in Vermont, I worked with uh, Beth at Baylet for, for a time. I work nationally with Molina Healthcare as a national account exec for them. They're a 99%, virtually 100% Medicaid managed care organization. Um, and since 2017, I've been running my own firm and working across the country um, on healthcare and almost exclusively on state facing Medicaid issues. Um, so, um, so anyway, it's great to be um, working on a Vermont project. And with that, um, I'm not sure if how we bring up, um, we need to share, Lorraine's gonna share her screen so that people can see, uh, ta-da. So uh, we're gonna run through the slides, the slides you should be able to see on your screen. Um, and you should I probably have them in your own inbox and posted to the website as well. Um, let me just pause, make sure everybody's um, ready to go. There's no questions or technical issues. 
I think we're probably good. And okay. and and just FYI for uh, committee members, if if you have a question, uh, please. Uh, I think you're going to have to just say I have a question because neither Representative Lippert nor I can see the entire group. And then, Josh, as we're going through, I may uh, or Representative Lippert may do some explanation as to why something isn't in, or I don't. You may already have that prepared, and some of the decisions that we made along the way. Yeah, um, I think there's absolutely, and um, uh, if the raise your hand option works, Aaron, um, uh, Lorraine can watch for that as well and cue me if people can't get a word in edgewise but can raise their hand on their screen. Um, okay, so with that, um, Lorraine, the next slide, please. We'll just run through sort of what we're going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about the task force charge, just as a reminder for everyone, um, level setting. Uh, talk about the process, because it was a robust, um, although time, time limited, um, as, as, all of our, <laughs> as all of our legislative processes are crunched. Um, uh, we'll talk about the process. We'll talk about the summary of recommendations. Um, and then that's where we're, we expect today to end and not to get into each of the four um, in detail. So this deck will um, just be to be continued at that point. Um, as part of the summary, um, we will talk about why, why we chose some of these, who they help, uh, how much they cost to implement, um, and uh, how long they take to implement. Uh, and how much they save potentially. So we will talk about some, you know, a bunch of um, significant issues for each of these options uh, and probably produce many, many questions, um, which is good um, and always happens as we go through, um, you know, big processes. Uh, so we welcome those and, and those that we can't get to today, we certainly will be around um, throughout the legislative process this year um, and available to meet with committees and, and explain options and dig into questions. Next slide, please. So the task force charge um, was to explore opportunities to make healthcare more affordable and accessible for Vermont residents and employers. That charge included um, a whole bunch of things, if you look at the actual legislative language, right, and include sort of what could we do today, um, what's going on, you know, at the federal level um, that we could take advantage of, what has Vermont done before, uh, what are other states doing, um, how long will it take to do these things, um, can we afford to do these things, uh, how much benefit do they have to individuals and families, um, and how expensive are they um, to accomplish? Um, and do we require federal approvals in order to accomplish them? Those are all things that are critical as we think about our healthcare system, where we are today, and, and how we might implement things. Um, I'm going to um, take a, just a, a brief pause here again, and, and Bill or Jenny, um, are there other um, pieces of the task force charge that you'd want to that you'd want to point out well one of the one of the charges was um, regarding equity in health care uh, and we will I, I we I believe we'll be commenting on that a little bit later but that was a that was a standalone important charge to be more inclusive in our health care programs and holistic holistically Perhaps something will, more will be said along the way, but one of the other uh, decision points was also, and perhaps reflected in the charge to some degree, that we wanted to focus on areas where we could, uh, which were, uh, that could be implemented in the near term or near long term, rather than just a long term vision. Yep. Very good. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'll, so I'll add one more thing because it's not, it wasn't in our charge, but it is in our charge. And that is, as we look at cost savings to healthcare and the healthcare system, we want to ensure that those savings go directly to Vermonters pocketbooks. Great. As always with uh, legislative charges, they're 
they're beefy, right? There's a lot in them, um, and there requires necessarily some um, attendance to detail on on what we drill down on, and as we drill down, that we don't lose sight of the larger charge, but that we find things that can be accomplished. And so, throughout the process, which I'm going to talk about next, um, we we the the task force made uh, a number of decisions and health system transformation supported those decisions with research um, meetings and a number of other pieces. So what I'm going to talk about next is the process that we went through to assure that the task force charge was properly addressed, um, that we didn't leave things out in the consideration, um, and sort of how we got from, from start to finish here. Um, I want to recognize as part of this that that I know, we all know, we're never finished, right? State government's going to be around for a long, long time, and people are going to need health care um, for a long, long time. And so uh, we recognize the place in time that we are, as well as the space in time that we are for accomplishing these things. And uh, I think that's just an, an important backdrop for this. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we were contracted um, in September. Um, and we uh, had the first meeting. We had public meetings um, on 9:29 of the full task force, on 10:28 of the full task force. We had a meeting in November as well that was scheduled of the first full task force, but it was um, uh, canceled due to a special session that was scheduled at the same time. Um, and so we had a third meeting on 12:15 of the full task force. So three meetings throughout the fall of the full task force. That. Um, those were big, long meetings, five-hour meetings. Um, they're all online, um, and the materials that were produced and the process we went through um, are part of those. You know, it's all part of the archives there for that. Um, but we did a lot more work um, that was happening throughout that time period. We had regular at updates weekly, um, nearly weekly updates with the task force co-chairs. Um, and multiple meetings um, with task force members um, individually um, and in twos um, to talk about areas that were of importance to them and to make sure that we were including um, the things that were necessary within each of the meetings. Uh, so we did meeting preps as well as um, updates on research and additional items. We had regular meetings, weekly meetings with the joint legislative joint fiscal office and ledge council staff um, to talk about many things, including what's going on in other areas. What's HROC doing? What's uh, happening with the with the uh, telecommunications and uh, task force for interstate for interstate telehealth? Um, what's going on with the health equity commission? Uh, what reports are is GMCB and OPR working on? So we wanted to make sure that we were aware of all of those things that were happening, and we leveraged the the information that your joint fiscal office and and ledge council have inherently from working on all of those from soup to nuts um, from the last legislative session and prior legislative sessions. We we then we concurrently. So this is all happening concurrently pretty much um, over the four month period. We had uh, informational interviews, structured informational interviews with healthcare leaders from 20 over 20 different um, organizations throughout Vermont. And in some cases, we had multiple conversations with with individuals from those organizations. So um, when we get into later on talking about the the individual um, options that ended up in the four options that are, that were actually uh, recommended here or will be recommended here. Um, when you look at some of those options, it may be obvious to you, right, like the, the moderate needs group uh, option, the Department for Aging and Independent Living, right, that department has um, owns that program, right? They operate that program. And so uh, we spoke to them a number of times. And same thing with programs where the Green Mountain Care Board um, or other departments would be impacted. We spoke to those departments a number of times to understand their programs um, and to make sure that we were 
um, making recommendations, which the governor may or the governor's staff and departments may or may not agree with the recommendations in whole, um, but they certainly understand them um, and what we're doing, right? They were part of that process as we walk through it. Um, and we recognize that there's lots of decision points that um, often are driven around uh, the you know, really tough choices between doing one thing or doing another. And so as part of uh, what the governor's staff recommends and what the legislature ultimately chooses to do, uh, we understand that these uh, options that we're going to get to, um, you know, fit in that big pantheon of things, right? And so uh, we were careful as we did this to make sure that we understood what was happening in Vermont today and to the extent that it would be shared with us, what was being proposed to be done tomorrow. And some of that will come out as we walk through things that we chose not to um, spend a lot of time on, some of which were are just as important, um, but were already being um, done and sussed out through these interviews that were being proposed and done in other places. So to the extent that important and critical things that, that do improve affordability and accessibility being done in other places, as we identified those things in talks with um, leaders across Vermont, uh, we then had task force conversations about to do or not to do, given that they're um, being done in other places. We also received um, correspondence from advocacy organizations. We met with um, advocacy organ those advocacy organizations um, in some cases multiple times. And uh, again, to make sure we understood what those recommendations were um, and that they were included in the discourse um, um, as the task force considered um, where to go on different items. Uh, the input included, as it always does, um, those informal conversations um, at the task force meetings, um, but they included, um, you know, at formal scheduled uh, discussions as well. We spent some significant time early on in the process um, researching other state activities and federal activities related to the task force charge, and in a number of cases, um, well, when you look at the actual option papers themselves, um, we've included uh, the state activities and the federal opportunities as part of as part of those papers themselves. Um, in a number of cases where other things were being considered in other states, um, you know, Vermont is a leader um, in many ways, and so there are lots of things that other states are doing that Vermont has done, um, has partially done or has decided not to do and has done something else um, similar, um, but slightly different. And so uh, when, when we see news articles and uh, papers and presentations from other states and from the federal government, um, we, we should, just as a reminder to us, remember to pat ourselves on the back in Vermont um, and, and think, wait, have we done this already? Did we do it? And, and, and the decided didn't work well for us. Um, there's quite a few things that others are trumpeting at any uh, point in time, are announcing at any point in time, which Vermont, you know, has done, you know, you know, very well uh, already. Um, and so many of the things that we identify when we do that type of research are things that that quickly go um, to the side because Vermont's already doing a pharmacy expansion for seniors, so already doing uh, an adult expansion, a child expansion, um, things that we've done, you know, very well um, for a long time. So next, next slide, please. Vermont has an all-payer claims database, an APCD. We've had one for a long time. Um, it's a mature database. In other words, that's worked out a number of kinks. There's always improvements that can be made to that, but it's a, it's a treasure as far as being able to compare information. It has uh, limits to it. Um, it has limits with the, the lives that are not included in it. Um, those ERISA payers, uh, so the large payer lives that uh, are not included in it. Um, it has limits because not all of the information um, flows over from commercial and and Medicaid claims in a way that can be compared. But the benefit of it is that the things that are in there can be compared. 
Um, and so that's an important distinction. Uh, we chose to use uh, V-Cures um, to mine data and to understand the Vermont um, healthcare um, system as it stands today. Uh, we recognize that that has limitations. And in fact, in some of the options, meaningfully in the, uh, in the moderate needs group uh, expansion option, uh, there are further data and that there is further data analysis that certainly the the state will do um, should you proceed on that one uh, that will mine the Medicaid claims data directly um, and uh, will not allow for some of the extension uh, of, inf of thought to the commercial side of the equation. So how would an expansion uh, impact the commercial side, but would provide additional detail that we didn't mine out in, in our analysis. So um, it's a key piece of information, but again, as we do complex healthcare analysis, we're always making those decisions, right? What to go into in depth um, with the time we have and what not to. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to get across here was that we, we thought about those things uh, and the team that's on the phone here, as well as a, an expanded team that included uh, uh, data analytics professionals um, and project management professionals and additional subject matter experts that we worked with throughout the process. Um, we, we gave some significant consideration um, to what we did and, and what we chose not to do. So number nine, that was number nine I just covered. Um, presentation of policy options, then we presented the options. So we started with over 20 different policy options in the first meeting um, that could be done potentially in Vermont, some of which are being done in Vermont and some of which um, um, don't fit exactly into Vermont. Uh, and then we narrowed down to seven different options. Um, and then we narrowed down to four different policy options to go into depth. So that was the process as we moved throughout the fall um, and early winter. Um, we drafted a white paper on the Medicare Savings Program, which is included in uh, the, the final report. Um, and that uh, program is another uh, significant program operating in all states. It is a program that uh, provides assistance to individuals uh, and it provides assistance specifically to individuals who um, need assistance because of their level of uh, income with paying for, uh, with paying for um, their uh, Medicare premiums in order to help them uh, obtain, obtain and keep their Medicare coverage. It fits in with a number of the other options, um, but it was not included as a full option here. Um, and we can have that uh, discussion, I think, when we talk about the four options papers um, that were included. Um, but we wanted to recognize that that was included as a white paper. Um, and we, we also included an affordability white paper. And again, uh, aff and affordability is an important piece of what the task force was charged to do um, and affordability um, that affordability white paper uh, was rolled into our um, was rolled into the first option on cost growth um, on cost growth and so it fits in that in that quite well and again those white papers if you go look are are posted they're available you can read them the pluses and minuses to them are there. Uh, who they impact is included, how they impact them, that's included as well. Um, but we uh, made some decisions again about what to include, what could be done, and what the pitfalls of trying to do too much all at once might be, for example, as uh, significant discussions that we had. We then collected and analyzed all of the above stuff and created a, a final report. The final report is actually pretty digestible. So a moment on that, right? Which is there is four pages of executive summary in the final report. They're reflected in this um, 
presentation, uh, that executive summary is reflected in this presentation today, um, in large part in whole in, that, in this presentation today, uh, using the tables and charts from that here uh, in this presentation. There are then 40 something pages in the report, or maybe more than that, um, but there's, there's a whole bunch of pages in the report, around 40 something, maybe 50 something, um, that are directly the options papers being described uh, to you in detail. And then there's a ton of appendices that include everything else that we've discussed and received uh, and what the task force did. So all of that is in that final report, um, should you wanna go through it. And there are citations throughout the body of the report that would lead you to, okay, where's this list of other things that you looked at? Or where's this list of people? I wanna know who you actually talked to. Um, those things are in appendices, so they're there um, as part of the record. Next slide, please. So what did we do? You know, okay, enough on process. What did we actually do? Um, we looked in starting back in September, we looked at how much did different things affect the affordability for people um, and at what level? How much does it affect? So how many people does it affect broadly and how much does it affect those people individually deeply? Um, we looked at that. We looked at accessibility. Um, again, how many people broadly um, have more access um, and how many people um, if it's a smaller group of people that get more access, you know, how much more access do they get? How, how critically important is that access? And where are those gaps in the Vermont system today? And where do we um, improve affordability and accessibility by a policy um, that the legislature could um, create and implement? How long does it take Time frame? How long is this going to take? Is this uh, is this a, a conversation like some of the conversations you've had um, that have been going on for decades and haven't happened, right? Um, so there are those types of things that can happen. Um, and um, I know um, having sat through many conversations out about expansion of healthcare um, and many experts like myself, right? Who have talked to Vermont about single payer um, and about other, um, programmatic lifts that are similarly um, attractive and, and very large and very complicated um, and very hard to get done, right? And one of the things that we talked about at length with the task force and the, the co-chairs was st sticking to items that we could do that, that could actually be implemented that would not um, be so large and so complex that we would end up doing a report that didn't, that didn't bear fruit. And um, so we, uh, we recognized that and there were decisions made around that um, about how, how, what could be done and how long it would take to do it. And, and then in the same line, number three, what's the programmatic lift? We're very aware that people are stretched, that state government has had one thing after another uh, given to them to implement and that um, we are small but mighty um, in Vermont, uh, in state government, and, but there's a, a limit to how much capacity we have and how, how much can be taken on and how much can be done in any single year or in any multi-year period. And so those things were um, discussed and talked about. Uh, and, and I know that you'll have those same conversations in committee as you, as you consider different options this, this session. We considered health equity impact and honestly, we had health equity as its own line mm -hmm. at one point internally that we were talking about. What can we do on health equity specifically? And um, we moved away from that um, purposefully um, to say that health equity is not something that you do by itself. It's something that has to be embedded in each option that gets considered and implemented. Uh, and that's because of course, if we implement a technological advancement, if we use, for example, COVID as an example, um, we rolled out purposefully nationally and in Vermont as well um, to priority populations who uh, would uh, most likely be, you know, that vaccine that we rolled out 
um, was rolled out purposefully um, and purposefully to the most vulnerable individuals. Um, and that uh, successful or not, uh, well, there'll be a retrospective on how successful that was in different geographies. And I think Vermont has been uh, lauded at our, uh, at, uh, for our approach and our execution um, in, in accomplishing that rollout. But that's an example of considering health equity um, and protecting the most vulnerable. And Vermont has a long history of that, but we can do better at it and we can consider equity in different ways. Um, and certainly as we mature as a country, um, uh, we on the health equity front, Vermont will learn from what others have done in that space and we'll be able to implement it. And we have several slides on health equity that we'll talk about, um, uh, but I just wanted to point out that it is it is and necessarily needs to be embedded in each option that's considered in each programmatic option that's considered um, and can be discussed um, theoretically outside of those, but the, the rubber hits the road when you're actually doing implementations. Um, so I lost the screen. I'm not sure what happened there. The, I'm not, did others lose the presentation? Yeah. Yes, it, we don't have it anymore. So we'll see if we can get that back. Was that Lorraine? That was Lorraine. I think yeah. we lost her, it looks like. Uh-oh. Oops. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, maybe either Claire or um, Aaron, can you share your screen and put the slide deck up? Uh, Claire, are you able to do that? Um, I can. Give me one. So I'll continue talking. Number five. <laughs> Sorry. I would continue with. Yeah, yeah, we have it. We we each have it on our iPads, but some iPads are occupied with people. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> number five on the on this slide six is the level of federal involvement needed. And so here we recognize that there's another committee, uh, the HROC that deals with waivers and Medicaid uh, issues in more depth. Um, and we again made a decision to keep track of that and to recognize that there are things that um, uh, might be such a big lift or the federal government isn't gonna do it that, that we shouldn't consider them. Um, but in other cases that um, there's, it might be a big lift and it belongs, um, the discussion belongs in another, in another forum. Um, and so uh, that's something that we did um, look at uh, quite carefully. Um, we have a great deal of experience in our team working with, um, working with federal involvement necessary. Um, but we, uh, uh, we took that into account uh, where it would be a stopper or where it would be um, something that uh, was likely to push the time frame in a significant way. Um, we did not get to the point of uh, drafting waiver language or, or something like that. Um, once the policy gets adopted by the legislature, there would be another process, a further process, and this is normal, um, for the governor staff to put together uh, at the Medicaid agency level um, the federal uh, engagement necessary. Um, there may also be some front-end conversations as you develop policy with, with CMS and other um, federal agencies to float ideas. And sometimes white papers are pushed up from states to the federal government to get their thoughts on things in advance of actual an actual application um, or letter requesting uh, a, a waiver. Um, and those things are all potentially in the hopper. And for some of the things that we're proposing, it might make sense to do some engagement, uh, it almost certainly makes sense to do some engagement with, uh, with your federal partners. And, and in the Vermont way, I think that would flow through um, uh, the administration um, with, with involvement or direction from the legislature. Um, 
So that's where we did. That's where we are with federal involvement. We'll talk about that some, but keep in mind that we try to stay out of HROC's lane uh, on on those items, and and so that that's how we manage that. And then, what's the state and federal cost savings? Um, certainly important. Um, what how we're gonna improve affordability and accessibility for Vermonters. But keep in mind that we can, easy way to improve affordability and accessibility for Vermonters is for the state government or the federal government to pay for it, right? Pick what it is. And if we can get the state government to pay for it in total or the federal government even better, right? To pay for it in total from a state perspective, um, then uh, the cost savings accrues um, to uh, individual families and individual Vermonters um, without a state or federal cost, but in, or there is a state or federal cost, but it doesn't, and, and it's huge, um, but, it, and it saves individuals and families lots of money. Those uh, things are obviously opposite sides of a coin, right? Where we save Josh, Josh's family lots of money by giving him free pharmacy, uh, but it costs society significantly to do so. And so um, I know that makes sense to everyone, but uh, occasionally as we get into some of these policy discussions, we're like, well, that's great. Let's do that. Let's go ask the federal government to pay for it. Um, and, and sometimes that's possible and sometimes it um, isn't. And, and some of our options, we're going to talk about the, the trade-offs there, um, sort of how much we can do now uh, quickly um, and, and how much it costs to do those things, right? Uh, and so, and who pays for it. So um, the next slide, please. So slide seven, um, going to talk about the seven options now that we drilled down to, right? So I spent I don't know how much time here, but I spent some considerable time getting us to sort of the options themselves. And now I'm going to spend the remainder of the time talking about the options themselves. So before I dive into this, I want to pause. Um, if there's any questions about what we did, why we did it, how we did it, um, I'm happy to talk about those things now. Representative Goldman. Hi. Oh, you can hear me. That's great. Um, I think we just got a letter from um, a group about being included in the appendix. I was just wondering, you know, what criteria do you use um, for including advocacy letters in your final report? I, um, I go ahead. So uh, we included the letters that we had available um, to us. I'm not sure if, if we missed one, we're happy to include it. Um, but if there's one that came after we produced the report, then it's not included. No, no I think, so I, it, uh, Josh, I think this is a letter that we actually had and put on our web page. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it would be fine to include it in the report and we can decide to do that tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. should be a part of it. Yeah. Yep. Just an oversight. Well, there was so much coming in and it's difficult to get it all. You know, the, the thing that, that hasn't been mentioned that I think is important is in June, uh, I forget when it was, it was either June or July, I met with uh, some the healthcare leaders at NCSL and asked them to support our work with um, what other states are doing and, and engage them. So they're not listed. I don't know if they're listed. I don't think they are, but um, there certainly are a number of folks who were very much a part of the work and, and helped us with this. And we don't, we really don't want to exclude anyone. That's not. I, I agree completely. Any that yeah. we've missed, we're happy to include the, the information that they supplied and, and credit that they participated. And so any oversights are on us um, in the production of the report right now. And we're happy to, ma to make those adjustments. Thank you. I, 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 mean, I know the chair's got the letter. So anyway, it got sent to all of us. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, so we can, we can uh, put that in. I don't, I don't think that requires any action on the part of the committee necessarily. Representative Donahue, have you have a hand? Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, maybe I can help clarify because 
if you look at the report itself, it's the report, it's the recommendations of the consultants. It's not the report of the task force where we might have things that were sent to us, but not the task force, because we actually haven't voted on, on adopting the report yet. No, I understand, yeah. but the, the, there was a letter of September 21st that they hope would be included in the final report, but we don't need to spend another minute. Yeah, I, I think we do better to actually continue with understanding what's in, yeah. the, in the recommendations. Let, let's go, let's go. Yeah. Okay, um, so on slide seven, we're gonna get into the, act, the options now, um, uh, the meat of the matter, right? So, as we went from 20 to seven, and I have the four that are here on slide seven, and then when we turn to slide eight, there's three others that were of considerable importance. Um, don't We're not gonna turn to slide eight yet, but when we do, there's three others that were of considerable importance, but were being done already um, by the legislature. And that's why we didn't uh, address those uh, with research and fiscal analysis and other things that are will be done or are being done in other places. The four that we did go into depth on, um, substantial depth on these and wrote papers for them, options papers with appendices and all that stuff, are cost growth benchmark and affordability standards. So these fit together really nicely, these four. They can be done independently. They can be done together. They can be done partially um, together. Um, and they can be sequenced throughout time. There's a lot of different things you could do. But cost growth, think of these in, in a few different ways here. Cost growth benchmarks and affordability standards um, get implemented in order to um, manage the total cost of, of growth in the healthcare system. So you have a six and a half billion dollar healthcare system in Vermont. Um, you have a whole series of uh, agencies, including the Green Mountain Care Board, DIVA, OneCare, um, that all play a role in that, um, and huge institutions, right? UVM Medical, um, all your FQHCs, uh, RHCs, uh, so federally qualified health centers, uh, rural health centers, um, community mental health centers, all of those different um, providers uh, and insurers, Blue Cross, MVP, uh, Workers' Comp, all the public employees, all of those folks buy healthcare and consume healthcare in Vermont. And the cost growth benchmark and affordability standard says, hey, we could apply an affordability standard as other states have done um, and say that for a family, it shouldn't cost more than X. Um, and we can apply a cost growth benchmark that says, you know, for the state, we should not grow more than Y. And we could tie that to things like wage growth, um, CPI, um, consumer price index. You can tie it to different things. That's a high level thing, right? Um, and if you save money on it, who saves the money um, requires tools to make sure that, um, to Senator Lyon's comment earlier, that the money that you save doesn't accrue to Blue Cross or to UVM, to a big institution. Um, some of it may, um, but that we have mechanisms in place um, to have those savings that happen at the cost growth benchmark and affordability standard level, that those savings accrue to families in Vermont. So think of number one as that high level, um, what are we trying to do as a state in managing growth in the future so that, it met, so that healthcare doesn't continue to gobble up more and more as a percentage of household income. It, it allows us to put a target and then to build underneath that target specific things that we would do as a state in order to, um, in 2022, 2023, 2024, in August, right? Pick a date, like we're actually going to uh, implement another program that would have an impact and that would um, help to meet our cost growth benchmark and affordability standards, right? Think of all the other options underneath here as options that would help to meet our cost growth benchmark, right? Next year and the year after. So extending moderate needs supports, you have a moderate needs program today um, at the Department for Aging and Independent Living. It helps individuals with their activities of daily living. It helps individuals um, who uh, you know, need help um, getting in and out of bed and going to the bathroom and getting their groceries. Um, and this is important, we'll talk about it later. It's important because when you hit 65, um, 
if there's three of us standing here, um, two out of three of us will need those ADL supports um, at some point from before you before you, before we pass on. Once you hit 65, um, you'll need those supports. There's individuals that need it underneath. It's just that uh, underneath 65, below 65 um, as well, and so they're not. We don't miss them as part of moderate need supports, but. When we supply those supports, um, we believe that we uh, improve people's quality of life, importantly. Um, uh, we know that there are individuals who don't access those supports for lots of different reasons. Um, and we know that when you do access them, that you're, uh, that you uh, are able to um, stay in your home and not go to an institution for a longer period of time. And so that's an important thing. Vermont's done a great job at this um, over time. Um, an extension here is one of the options. Public option. The public option is an insurance option. So think of this as a, as a price option. How do we control price in the market? How do we improve access to, um, to healthcare is one thing you can think about public option. In some states, people don't have access to insurance products. In Vermont, um, the place that we have, the singular place where we have a problem here is in our individual and small group market. Um, and so when we think of public option here, we're not thinking of it in some other states, you might implement uh, an insurance product that's, um, that the state government has mandated um, that is a smaller benefit, right? It's not a benefit that's, that's as broad as other um, products. We don't believe that would be very attractive in Vermont, um, given the market and, and where we stand as far as providing accessibility um, to lots of different services. Um, and so what we're really talking about here is addressing the employer market, the small employer market, right? About 35,000 individuals in that market today. Um, the costs there have spiraled upwards, um, and it is a place where we can control price with a public option um, that has impacts um, for sure, um, uh, but those impacts are um, directed here at being positive to the employer purchase of insurance and offer of insurance at the small group level to individuals and their families. Notice that cost, cost growth benchmarks, high level, Extending moderate needs, very specific to a group of individuals, right? Up to 18,000 people, individuals um, that we could extend moderate need supports to, primarily older folks. Public option, a price control mechanism that extends to up to 35,000 individuals, perhaps some more if we looked at the individual market, but we're really targeted at the small group here. Um, and primarily those folks are younger um, and healthier. Um, and, and price is the problem there, right? So different groups um, uh, being impacted there. Expand the blueprint for health. So here's another one. Vermont's done a great job, right? Don't forget again to, to say, hey, we've done a great job. We have a nationally recognized community health teams all over Vermont that provide um, supports to individuals, including individuals that are opioid dependent um, or substance, abuse, substance use dependent, um, as well as others who have chronic conditions and just complicated health care that they need to help coordinating and managing. Um, our blueprint teams um, take referrals today and support individuals across Vermont, right? So what we say here is we should expand the blueprint for health, but we should apply some return on investment um, uh, to this. We should apply some uh, ROI analysis, and we should apply some front end identification and stratification of the population in order to assure that we are helping folks and we can demonstrate that the blueprint is successful financially to the payers and providers in the state, as well as the state government. That's important because C number one, in order to drive down our cost growth over time, we have to demonstrate that each one of the things that we do from a public policy perspective the impacts number one. And we have to do that um, in a diligent way over time. Um, so for everything that comes before us. 
one of the uh, one of the items that's that's not explicitly listed here, but that um, health system transformation is recommended, um, and we discussed at length with with the task force, is uh, is having a statewide population identification and stratification and return on investment vendor that would be located in number one that would be hired and utilized to do the analysis in a standard way for big policy changes that were coming before the legislature. So that you would always have in front of you when you had a proposal um, to consider, you would have a vendor, a third party that was doing that analysis consistently for you on the front end. Who is this gonna help? How much is it gonna cost? How much could we potentially save? And then in follow-up in future years, how much did it cost? <laughs> how much did we save? How many people uh, did, it, did it help? And that's the way we improve affordability and accessibility over time systematically, right? So when I say, when we say these things fit together, these aren't the only things we could do, but keep track of the fact that these are things that Vermont needs today. They fit into the context of what Vermont is, has done in the past. There are things where we believe the federal government will be a partner and want to support um, what we're trying to do here and have um, a financial stake in what we're trying to do here um, happily. Um, and there are items that can be done in pieces so that you don't have to bite off extending moderate needs to 18,000 people today to help start helping, right? You could extend moderate needs to 500 people today. You could extend it. Um, and there's lots of ways to go about slicing these up, which we're gonna get into in the next slides. Um, Josh, um, you know, as we went through a lot of this in our uh, task force work, we did identify uh, programs and people that we felt were key to the success for the options, the chosen options. And maybe as you're going through, you could talk a little bit about our, uh, our discussion or support for primary care in particular, since that is sort of the bottom line for the options that we're looking at, at the, on the, um, provider side. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um for sure. Uh, next slide, please. So a few other things that we, um, that task force very interested in, but we're, um, uh, we chose not to pursue as options, full options, where we applied the full um, Monty of analysis to, because they're being done in other places, right, in Vermont. Not that they're not important, but the postpartum expansion, so that's a Medicaid option to expand for um, moms and babies um, to 12 months. And we believe that we understand that the administration is proposing or has proposed that or is doing analysis on that um, for the legislature already. And so we didn't pursue that analysis. Uh, we, we believe, HST believes, um, that that is something that should be done. It's, it's uh, uh, very close to a no-brainer to do it. Um, and uh, And... So, and that's an important from an equity perspective and as well as um, when you think about costs, the federal government's gonna pick it up for the first um, period of time. Um, remote access to care, there's a whole bevy of things happening in the legislature on that from coordinating telehealth across multiple states to, uh, to supporting uh, broadband expansion uh, and uh, and technologically uh, approving options to provide technology in the home. And so all of those things are being done um, in Vermont. It's not that we couldn't do more there. It's just that it's a crowded field where there's a lot of attention already. And so the task force chose um, not to spend our research time on that. Um, pharmacy benefit manager regulation. Again, there's a bill on the wall. Uh, I understand um, that the task force is supportive of. Um, not to speak for, for the task force, but I, I believe that's the case. I've heard it said. <laughs> um, and so uh, how that comes out um, at the end of session um, will be what it is, but the, that's an, another area that we, we believe at HST is an important area to consider. Um, and we, the task force chose not to have us pursue it since it's being pursued in other areas. Next slide. So um, 
I talked about this already. I think implementing options strategically, um, how they fit together is something to consider. And also importantly, um, that they should be evaluated in relationship to initiatives that are already underway, right? Um, or under consideration. And I know that you do that um, as part of the legislative process and that um, my friends in the administration in Vermont and in the advocacy community will continue to um, make sure that, that you are aware of the things that they are doing and that they are advocating for as part of the process as they should. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Slide 10, next slide, please. So here's the summary description. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here because I think I spoke about the summaries of these in the, in the prior slide when, when I was talking about them. Um, these summaries uh, include a little bit more detail than I spoke about or, or slightly different detail. Um, and I'm happy to take questions on them. I'm just looking through to see if there's something in particular that I wanted to note here. Okay, I'm good, next slide. So here's the summary justifications for these slides. Uh, I mentioned, uh, for example, that uh, under cost growth benchmark and affordability standards that we need to have underneath it uh, a return on investment and that we need to uh, tie what we choose to do to accelerating savings so that we can capture those savings for rate payers in the system. Um, also, I mentioned um, as part of this that 70% uh, of us, once we reach 65, will need supports with ADL. Uh, I think that's a primary justification for extending moderate needs supports. Um, uh, and in the public option that there are we are, and I want to be explicit about this, you know, when I talk about using it on the price front for small employers, that we are talking about price being different here as a primary way to drive savings. Um, there's other things you can do, but competition's been talked about by my, my friend Tim. And in Vermont, we know that competition is a different beast than it is in California or New York, right? Where New York has 19 plans in the Medicaid space. Last time I checked, maybe it's 21 or 18 now, but it's, it's you know, a dozen and a half or more. Um, and uh, that, that type of uh, competition across different um, across different offerings in the in the space is just not going to happen in a small state um, like Vermont, and so competition is different here. Um, but I also wanted to be express in the point that having a rate that is uh, below today's commercial rates um, doesn't mean that every rate is below in, in a design in order to create savings. And it doesn't mean that every rate is so far below that it would be um, uh, devastating to the healthcare system, right? Um, and so um, some, of the, some of what you will hear from folks that will be against the public option with a rate structure that's differentiated will be that this is uh, an apocalypse, right? Like this will be the end. Um, and we have workforce issues and it's hard to, and, and let, let me say, we know that there's a workforce group um, and we know that there are workforce issues and explicitly the workforce issues that we have, not enough nurses graduating, um, doctors at the primary care level being paid less than uh, specialists that, you know, and, and so making it harder to get people to go into and stay in primary care and locate in rural areas. Those issues aren't new issues. They um, are significant and they are national. Um, and so when we raise rates for nurses, for example, um, in Vermont, um, and our rate goes to say 10% above the New Hampshire rate, um, it puts New Hampshire in a position of needing to raise their rate, <laughs> right? So we, we become, uh, uh, we have an issue um, as a state 
and we have to deal with it. And, and, it, and there's a whole workforce group and we chose, and the task force chose not to deal with the workforce issue because it's being dealt with in other groups explicitly. Um, and that I think is the most important thing. And, and Josh will say also that this is an issue on the workforce front that sh we shouldn't allow to stop us from doing other good things. Um, so that's a Josh statement, um, right? And, and others can disagree with it, but that, that we will have the workforce issue for a long time and we will have lots of options that are on the table um, that have been, that push dollars to and other incentives to keeping the workforce vibrant in Vermont and attracting folks uh, to Vermont. Um, and we, we error if we allow the workforce issue to become the reason we don't do other policy things. Um, so I'm gonna move off of public option now and expand Blueprint for Health. Again, I, I, I'm purposefully putting things here that I know are um, challenging, right? These justifications on page 11 include things that we know are challenges. The ERISA, player, ERISA payers, um, the large employers who um, have their own, um, who are carrying their own risk um, and have, uh, and have an ASO or a TPA, a third party administrator um, like Cigna supporting their lives in the market um, are different beasts because the state can't regulate them in the same way. Um, my friend Beth will talk about how other states, um, those payers do participate in the cost growth benchmark and affordability standards um, exercises and supply data. And, um, and I think that they can be uh, influenced to do so in Vermont as well. Um, but it is true that you can't regulate, you can't mandate them to do, to do stuff like participate in the community health teams, the blueprint health teams. Um, but we can make a case for them, again, go back to the ROI, that, that paying for the health teams is something they should do because it has benefit that accrues to them. If we can draw the line for them with our return on investment, then we can pull those ERISA players, payers into participation in, in supporting the blueprint teams, for example. Um, and I believe that is true. Um, and in order to know that it's true, we would have to do that analysis um, on a regular basis. And that's one of the recommendations. Next slide, please. Okay, who does it help? How many people does it help? How long does it take to do this? Um, so the bottom line is that if we do this, if you look in the estimated number column, the third column over there, um, the cost pros Benchmark helps everybody as we push down rates, helps every rate payer in the system. Um, so it helps all Vermonters. Um, and, you know, lest we, again, let's not error and say that if I'm on Medicare or Medicaid, it doesn't help me. Um, because to the extent that our growth is lower, um, we can afford to pay for more services, right? Like uh, price is lower, unit, units can go up, right? Uh, and so there's a direct relationship inside of, inside of the healthcare system to things like increasing rates for primary care. So one of the issues that we have is a primary care workforce issue. Another issue that we have is not enough, is not enough access to those uh, appointments, those uh, primary care appointments, right? To the extent that we are able to implement a public option, let's just use that as an example, where we push down on lots of rates, we could still push up in that public option on primary care rates, right? So you could push up on certain rates and down on others in that design um, purposefully to encourage um, and support uh, primary care. Right. And in addition, um, as we do rate setting um, at the at uh, GMCB um, for our payers, 
um, we could push primary care rates. And other states like Rhode Island have done exactly that, um, which is to push up primary care rates as part of rate setting. So that those things are things that are underneath the hood here as we start thinking about how these play off of each other and how we impact more Vermonters, how we make things more accessible. Hey, I don't have access to primary care today. What can we do about that? Can we push on price with a public option? Can we push on price with the cost growth benchmark and affordability standards? The answer is yes in both cases. Um, there's there's reasons why that has imp other impacts that should be considered. Um, but I wanted to, to point out that as we look at affecting as many Vermonters as possible and as deeply as possible, we are trading off affordability and accessibility throughout these packages, um, uh, right? Like necessarily we are. Um, so impacting 600,000 people plus um, with cost growth benchmark and affordability standards, but not impacting them gigantically or all equally, right? When we get into doing the moderate needs supports and the public option and the expand public, expand the blueprint, we're, we're really targeting different, different folks for different reasons. In the moderate needs, 500 to 18,000, wow, that's a big range, right? Wow, that's a big range. Purposefully a big range because we could impact 500 today and 500 to more, more tomorrow um, and not blow the bank, like not be able to afford it, right? Like if we have tried to implement 18,000 today, I recognize that's a big lift, right? There's gonna be a lot of state money, a lot of federal money that has to go to support that um, right away. And, and frankly, we, there's almost certainly not 18,000 additional people that need that support today, um, but over the next five years or six years, that's a number that absolutely we could build, build up to and, individuals um, will come on and need those supports as we go. Public option up to 35,000, yeah, um, and that's a real number. That's about 70,000 in the individual and, and small group market. About half of them are in the small group in the employer plans today. Um, and so to the extent that you have a public, that we implement a public option specifically targeted to small employers, you impact 35,000 people and, and the number of employers um, is significant, those small employers, right? Um, and the blueprint for health, um, the analysis is, analyses that we've seen um, show that about 10% of the state's population um, at any point in time could benefit from care management services. Um, we don't have um, the counts of everyone in the state that's receiving care management services today. There's lots of different ways to count that. Um, there's lots of different ways to define care management and care coordination. Um, and that's another piece of work um, that certainly um, uh, could be done um, and perhaps should be done as part of this um, uh, expansion uh, and certainly is something that is doable. Um, but those community health teams help people today in lots of different ways. And they're not all identical in any, they're, they're nowhere near identical in, in how much help an individual receives for how long and for what services. And there are other care management and case management services. So let's keep this in mind as we think about um, making the case for, for the ROI analysis and actually doing stuff um, in the future. Blue Cross Blue Shield, UVM, Dartmouth, the FQHCs, go around the list, all do some amount of care, case management, care coordination. The definitions are different. The programs that are being um, utilized for different groups um, uh, are different. You know, So there's case management uh, and care management that have to do with individuals receiving high, high cost services or lots of services um, and managing managing on that front. There's coordination of different types of services for people. Um, we don't have to, at the, at the um, legislative policy level, get into all of those nuances. What we do have to know is that in order to convince the system, the, blue, the payers, the big integrated health systems, the primary care physicians, in order to convince them that the, what they're referring people to is something they should refer more people to, 
we have to demonstrate that there is a benefit, that there is an outcome benefit to the individuals and that there is a cost benefit to the payers. And if we can demonstrate those two things, then we'll get increased referrals to programs and we will guaranteed um, that will happen. If we can demonstrate that there's, a, that there's a cost savings to the payers and an improvement in quality to the individuals, you will get increased referrals to a program. Um, and that, that, that's what we're targeting here. Next slide, please. So what does it cost to implement these things? And um, what's the ongoing costs and how much savings is there? So first of all, yeah. Josh, uh, I want you to continue. And just to know that the House uh, Health Care Committee has a hard stop at 1030. OK, I will um, spend uh, my time on this slide then. Um, there's a lot here. Um, and yep. in seven minutes, I'm not going to get to health equity, which is the next two slides. Um, we can pick up on health equity. Um, uh, I don't think I can do both in seven minutes. No, let's. Let, I think, um, and our committee will be picking this up on Friday. I think House Healthcare will be picking it up another day. So let's uh, let's go through what you can on this slide, and then we can always retrace our steps at some point. Okay, so I'm going to start with potential savings on the right. That's sort of the most exciting thing. Like that. Like my, the newspaper man uh, would start with the potential savings, right? There's a lot of savings here. So, um, but I want to point out that these are savings um, that are hypothetical, right? Like they they, they could happen, um, but it depends on how we implement um, what all the stuff under the hood to the left, right? Like how many, how big do we go to begin with, with how many people we enroll and. How much do we spend on on analytics and ROI and and what are the policies? What what are the policy levers that we give to the to and the programmatic levers that we give to the departments? You know, so how aggressive do we allow folks to be in essentially? So one percent, we have a six and a half billion dollar health system. Um, uh, Five percent growth. You know, one percent growth is sixty five million. Uh, a year. So if you have a 5% growth trend and you carve it, you say it's not going to be more than 4%, then you save 65 million. A and we can do that. States are doing that. Um, it requires levers underneath the hood, like, okay, in order to save that money, how do we do it? Right. And so I wanted to point out for the cost growth benchmark that you have to do the things down below or some other things down below that allow, um, that allow us to achieve those savings. Um, just saying we're gonna slice 1% off of your trend, it's gotta come from somewhere, right? Um, and so you can push on price, you can push on utilization, you can, you can push, on, push on coverage. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do to push down, to tamp down cost growth. Um, they all have impacts on some buddies um, and in some amounts. Um, so what does it cost to, to, so let's go down then, uh, stay in the potential savings on the right-hand side, um, skilled nursing home annual costs are in Vermont, that's actual number $117,348 on average per year for a skilled nursing home um, uh, in Vermont. Um, to the extent that we roll out moderate needs supports and we uh, avoid 100 uh, admissions a year, we save $11.7 million. And that's not unreasonable to consider that we would extend moderate need supports and that we would, that we would avoid um, 100, 200, 300. It depends how many people we extend those supports to um, and how uh, we target the individuals that we extend those supports to. So again, doing that identification and stratification of individuals and extending supports in order to save dollars um, is something that can be done. Um, it, there's equity choices in there. There's a bunch of significant issues in there about how, um, about how to roll this out that we need to think about as part of it. Um, but, but certainly there are cost savings um, to doing it. Public option. Uh, and Tim, keep me honest here. Uh, Nevada is that a Nevada number, the thirteen hundred? Or yeah, it is. Okay. So um, 
So in Nevada, they targeted um, 1300 a year. Um, and, uh, and if we were to target a savings number, so again, here, when you roll out a public option, you can say, we're going to save 5% off of last year's rates. We're going to save 10% off of last year's rates. Now let's figure out the program design to do that. Um, and so you can target this number to not any number you want, but to a broad range of numbers. Um, and this is not an unreasonable uh, uh, number to target it to, but it is, it is, a, it will have an impact. It is aggressive, right? It is, it is an impact that folks will claim it's, it's, will have a deleterious effect on workforce, for example. Um, and that's something to keep in mind and to think about. Um, the, the blueprint for health expansion, the, honestly, the literature is mixed on the range of financial outcomes for care management. So see my earlier comment that care management and case management, care coordination, there's a broad range of things you can do. If we do a specific targeted group of things, and we get that definition down, we can peg an ROI to it. If we do sort of broad range of all kinds of different stuff, the ROI disappears in the, in the, in the melee, right? It, it disappears. Um, and so that's something where diligence is really important to identifying and stratifying populations and going after interventions where there's actually a benefit. Um, we can go after benefits that are harder to measure, but we, but see my earlier comment about getting payers to drive people to um, programs. They'll drive people to programs consistently over time if there's a return on investment from those programs, if they save money on those programs. Tying it to increase improving health outcomes is also true. So if we tie those, we look for those things where we have health outcome improvements and payer savings, we can guarantee that we'll continue to drive enrollment. When we can't do both of those things, we can't guarantee that we'll either have savings, one or two, that will drive, that will continue to drive people to those programs over time. I recognize that we are um, right at the end. The ongoing costs and the costs to implement our estimates, I'm happy to talk about those in detail. I think that the investments in the cost to implement, um, for example, on cost growth targets, that four to six million, there's a bunch of stuff in there. There's staff for GMCB or who, I think that's where that would happen, as well as for the vendor at the statewide level. And that assumes three years of those costs for those individuals in order to, for example, say, if you wanted to use one-time money for the things in the cost to implement and say, hey, in order to do this, we could do it for three years because you can't do it for one year and then say, did, did it succeed or not? You have to do it for three years so you can actually get look at all three years and see how you succeeded. And then in the ongoing costs, that's after that implementation period. So I just wanted to be clear that you don't add these together and say we have to budget that this year. That's not the case. You would implement the cost. The cost to implements for now and the cost for ongoing is for after. Um, we are right at the end. And so I wanted to be respectful of that. And there's so much. I hope that it well, was- Well, Joshua, thank you. Claire, we could take the uh, slides down. Thank you for that. And thanks for chipping in. I, uh, Lorraine lost her electricity. That's oh. why we lost her. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Joshua, thank you. And our uh, Senate Health and Welfare will dive into this a little bit more on Friday, and then we'll be setting up additional time in our committee to go through the report and to see what it is that we might want to put in place through legislation this year. Uh, and I know that House Health Care will also be uh, working on this, but the Senate, the Senate Health and Welfare Committee has been given the honor of beginning that process. Uh, so uh, we'll look forward to having you in our committee. I'm sorry that we don't have more time today for questions. Uh, it, it, we, we're going to have to go back and do that whether individually or uh, collectively, uh, or two committees together. So we will definitely do it in, the, in Senate Health and Welfare. Right. Anything else, so, Representative Lippert? No, uh, we, do have, we do have other 
witnesses uh, awaiting us. So thank you, Joshua and others. And we were, we will return to this uh, after consulting further with Senator Lyons and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. So okay. with that, I, I would just uh, encourage or walk, I suggest that House Health Care Committee members uh, go off of the joint. <laughs> we have to move out of our joint Zoom room and go back to our individual Zoom room uh, at this time. Thank you. Terrific. And Senate Health and Welfare, just stay right here. Don't go away. <laughs> Thank you.